Hello, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we're very pleased to welcome you to our program with author Roger Rappaport for his new book, Searching for Patty Hearst, a novel. If you're new to the Mechanics Institute, of course, we were founded in 1854 and were one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, our international chess club, and ongoing author and literary programs, and on Friday night, our cinema lit film series. After our talk tonight, uh, we'll have a Q&A with you, our audience, and also have book selling and some signing with Dr. Rappaport. So I'd like to introduce our special guest. Roger and I go back a long way because he also was a, a resident and native of Berkeley where my cousin's bookstore, easygoing travel shop and bookstore hosted many author events. And with Roger's background in writing and publishing and journalism, we were very pleased to have him as a guest speaker many times. So uh, it's great to have you here at San in San Francisco at the Mechanics Institute. And I'd like to, to introduce a little more about Roger. Roger Rappaport is an award-winning author, filmmaker, and playwright. His work appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Wired, The Atlantic, Esquire, Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, and other outlets. His films have been shown at festivals around the world. That includes Coming Up for Air, which won 30 festival awards, including seven for Best Feature Film, and Pilot Error, which took four Best Feature Awards. Rappaport's books include The Great American Bomb Machine, <coughs> Hillsdale, Greek Tragedy in the American Heartland, is the library burning? The big player, and also into the sunlight, light after the iron curtain, and several other titles. He was a publisher of the San Francisco Bay Area's RDR Books from 1993 to 2010. And as a travel writer, he published multiple guides and was editor of the very successful I Should Have Stayed Home which was also presented at our easygoing travel bookstore. Uh, Roger was on the ground covering the Patty Hearst saga as it unfolded, and he gained insider access to the elite and secretive world of the Hearst family and many of the key behind the scenes players. Searching for Patty Hearst is his first novel and draws heavily on his in-depth reporting of the case. And tonight, he's here to share uh, his experiences and how he got to write this novel, Searching for Patty Hearst. Roger. So, um, if you don't mind, when you start, I'll uh, we'll begin um, the cover story. Um, so you've seen this cover, but what you haven't seen is the cover you couldn't make the cover. Thanks to AI, we're going to show them to you right now. I think about it. I have FOMO. I can hear it now. So I decided, I decided I had to go with a brand, brand new direction. direction. So I decided so I, I had to turn it. Uh, so I'm going to go with a brand new direction. It's done, though. This is a very simple problem. problem. Paddy Paddy has as a Roman goddess, goddess in San Francisco. And then, so, so what did we do in writing Willie Wolf and Steve Weed? And I started, I started to see a kind, kind of fun, fun you can have. have. Some, Some of the images didn't look anything like Patty. Some, Some of them did. And as, as I used to get deeper down the rabbit hole, I tried, I tried the different styles, styles of the paintings. Tish. Tish. The Venus to me, though. Birth, 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 
The different, different ages, ages that came from William Wolfe to see we, we just seem to have a bad relation to what happened again. Then, then I guess it's a sort of romantic, romantic genre. genre. This, this for a while seemed to be quite productive. productive. This, this was going to be one of the covers. Then, then I decided, decided that, that was the story. I had to get it back. Okay. And then it was too much. We're getting to the kind of. Bond the movie poster. poster. This, this is what the plot I really hear. Then, then I realised, realize, back, back to the action show, that we were searching, searching for Patty, for who Patty was. was. And then, then the idea came, came for a prompt, prompt of the photo wall. Searching, searching for Patty. And that, that brought us to this. As soon as, as, soon as I, I saw this, saw this the earrings that didn't pluck, pluck from, from somewhere, somewhere, the news print. print. The idea is so much is about the media, about her, her the media, over the years. years. We're, we're searching for Patty Hearst, we're searching, searching for the media. media. Today, of what, what that meant. One, one strange little thing, thing. One, one quirk about, about AI. AI. We're, we're about to press, and I wonder, wonder what, what colour Patty's eyes. Turns, Turns out they're brown, brown. Not, not what they are thought, thought, which was blue. A <coughs> couple of minutes in Photoshop, Photoshop and, they're and they're brown. brown. And, and so, so we ended, ended up with this 1970s era iconic, iconic image, image of Patricia Hearst. As, as an, an actor, actor and designer, designer, I am kind, kind of worried about where, where this will go. But, but for now, now for this, this it seems the perfect solution. A novel about Patty Hearst. Fictional cover of a fictional, fictional panel. Composited, composited from 50 years of images out there in Hearst newspapers, Hearst TV, TV shows, Hearst webcasts. 50, 50 years with this eternally slippery story that has evaded everyone's grasp. And the unreliable rate, AI, is, is just acting on, on vast data and prompts that I give. It doesn't know what it's doing, it's doing what it's told. Maybe the AI. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm beginning, beginning to fall in love, love with my character. character. <laughs> and maybe this cover is the first, first example of AI syndrome. See how hard it is to be a cover designer? <laughs> um, I'm going to, for the two or three people in the audience who don't know the whole story, um, uh, the rest of you bear with me, we're going to do a, a short recap of uh, why we're here. The short answer is, Patty didn't listen to her mother. If she'd gone to Stanford, none of this would have happened. She went to her. So um, here's what happened. Um, 1973, uh, a comic named Donald Freeze um, and several other um, people, including Joseph Romero and Russ Little, um, formed the SLA. Um, there was another guy who claimed to be part of this name, Clifford Deathrow Jefferson and Colson, who was one of the longest uh, held death row inmates in California. Um, and they had a very kind of vague, um, uh, basically, mission statement, as you can see. Uh, they were very broad in their focus. Um, the Freeze uh, established himself as the general field marshal uh, along with uh, death row Jefferson. Um, and then they gradually decided they had to figure out how they were going to get some identity because they only had, they were getting about 10, uh, 10 members. Um, here's one of them. Uh, the Freeze was the only black member of the SLA. Uh, many of the rest were uh, students. Um, there was an actress. Um, and Perry, uh, had been a campaign for their cold water. Um, and then kind of changed your mind. And uh, there was a librarian uh, in the group, uh, working with the library and so on. Um, and gradually they got involved in the prison uh, reform movement, basically, through an organization called the Black Cultural Association, um, following the visit of prisoners and so on. Um, so they decided they needed to get going uh, in Oakland, where the school superintendent uh, had uh, initiated a uh, program for uh, metal detectors, student IDs, and also some psychological profiling mm -hmm. of what students might likely become uh, criminals. Um, and uh, so they assassinated this man, uh, much like uh, Marcus Foster almost killed his deputy, um, Blackburn. Uh, this was a dis 
disastrous and terrible mistake. Many people on the left, including Angela Davis, uh, uh, Jim Fonda, Ramparts Magazine that I wrote for, uh, ran an editorial attack, and then uh, basically there was concern that they were Zsa Zsa provocateurs. And as one of the weathermen uh, told me later, he said, you know, they were making us look bad. <laughs> Um, so now they were in the safe house, the one we just saw in Concord, and the two suspects, Russ Little and Joe Romero, uh, were arrested uh, for the uh, an accused uh, charge with the murder. Um, and uh, they had left a lot of evidence in the safe house, which they tried to burn down and fail. And on the hit list, in the safe house, that the police and the media, because they got through police station, recovered. They had a long list of corporate executives that they were going to go after. And one of their targets was the director of the Department of Corrections in Trichini. They were aiming pretty high. Um, well, what turned out, they decided they had to do something a little uh, less, uh, less terrifying. Uh, so they decided, instead of just going out and shooting school superintendents, um, they would uh, kidnap uh, a young woman named Patty Hurst. Uh, who was uh, a student, a nurse student at Berkeley. She had met her boyfriend, Steve Wee, uh, when he was her math teacher at Crystal Springs School for Girls in Hillsboro. Uh, at the time she was 16, they began the career when she was a junior. Um, and uh, they moved to Berkeley later after she finished uh, middle college. And um, they were uh, going to get in June. And that wedding engagement announcement caught the eye of the SLA and they went perfect. You see money? And lots of publicity, and nobody, nobody gets hurt, right? So um, there were now um, 10 members of the SLA, um, and probably one of the smallest revolutionary groups in the um, The kidnapping left weed very badly beaten. Um, Patty was in a closet in the city where they was the first time up for more than 50 days. Um, but gradually, uh, they, they kind of warmed to her, and um, she kind of um, they, they, she went through kind of a re-education process, um, and uh, she got very close to one of the kidnappers, a guy named Willie Wolf, who was the only member of the SLA who had sort of a privileged background, just a little bit. His dad was a successful uh, physician in um, Connecticut, so he grew up, you know, in fairly well off. The rest of them were pretty much middle class, from middle class. Um, so as part of the ransom, uh, they initiated the food program. Um, so she began issuing these very articulate communiques 
that showed up in one page of the department of history. And to put all these theories to rest, all these theories that she was really uh, just a pawn, pretending to be a revolutionary, uh, she went on camera during a bank robbery of uh, a San Francisco bank uh, owned by the father of a childhood friend. Uh, and they did pretty well, they got $10,000. Uh, but by this point, she was now a wanted criminal. And there's her wanted poster. Um, so she was no longer a kidnap victim. This had never happened before. This was a unique event. There's never been a kidnap victim who turned into a bank robber, you can imagine. Um, she also announced that she'd fallen in love with Gloria Hall. And the wedding was off. Steve Weed, her fiance, was toast. <laughs> Uh, and she accused her family of being, you know, trying to protect them. They had no interest in her, you know, saving one of their own. They do everything they could to protect the corporation. Of course, Randy, on, on publicized, was trying to work with people who knew the SLA, particularly convicts, who had some way of getting hold of the SLA leaders, even, even Letterman, uh, to reach out to the SLA and say, let her go, let her go. Uh, but she was afraid of that. She had this, this big fear. Was going to happen. Now she was a bank robber, not just a rest of her. Um, well, uh, there's Willie, uh, there's Steve. Uh, he's now trying to ransom her, convinced that all this is, you know, just crazy propaganda that she's in. He doesn't believe it. Um, here they are. Uh, this is the, F the FBI was always a couple days late. Uh, the FBI had flowing tons of agents in the area. You remember uh, a guy named Jimmy Moffat, the Kingsford Well, they hadn't found him. So they were under a lot of heat. Uh, that was a big, a big blow to their, their reputation. But even though they flooded the Bay Area, uh, they kept uh, getting leaked. So meanwhile, the SLA knew that they were in trouble. Uh, they knew that San Francisco wasn't going to work. So they went down to LA, which is where DeFries had a lot of friends, and they divided into three teams, and Patty joined the heiresses. Bill was her kidnapper, and that was his wife, Emily. And uh, they decided to go shopping. During the shopping episode, Bill was tackled by a security guard. Patty lying on the floor in the back seat. I know this is true because Bill Harris uh, called me after the book came out and been talking about this. And so he gave me the blow by blow. The story is that Patty was in the back, lying on the floor. And she heard this commotion, jumped up, grabbed an M1. She was trained on. Her father had trained her how to shoot when she was in the back. And uh, now she and a machine gun, which she never shot, fired off about 80 miles. The Harris's escaped, but there was a problem. The van was hot, so they had to get rid of it. And uh, so in order to do that, um, they had a carjack, this young man, and this was Patty's first kidnapping. She, <laughs> she kidnapped Tom Matthews along with the Harris's, um, and they took him on what he considered to be kind of a joy run. Obviously, it wasn't a joy But Patty was great. He, he testified in her trial later. She was arrested, but she couldn't have been more sympathetic. He felt like there was real empathy because she'd gone through a kidnapping. She told him um, that she had had a, a dream before the kidnapping that this was going to happen, and then um, rubbed his back and kind of, kind of be calm, and then gave him a big kiss. Uh, we left, but there was a problem. On that van was a parking ticket. Um, the police now had a positive ID on the SLA hideout. They left, but some of the neighbors ratted them out. And in the biggest firefight in American history, on American soil, 9,000 pounds, six of the SLA members, including the police, Willie Wolf, uh, and uh, Portland uh, Dodge. Um, and uh, I later interviewed the coroner, Thomas Gucci, Marilyn Monroe, James Joplin, Bobby Kennedy, and the SLA. And uh, they were burned alive. So it took them a long time, days, to figure out who was who. And of course, the families didn't know, and no one knew that Patty was in that house. So they, the LA police were really can imagine uh, burning them alive, not knowing that Patty was in there. It was a very a big risk. Um, now, Har Harris and Patty were at the time of the uh, firefight in a motel in Anaheim across the street from Disneyland. So they watched it live on television. There's Willie's. There's Willie's. Uh, and in a very emotional <coughs> um, uh, eulogy, she uh, did a tribute to all of her fallen comments, including Willie, who she called the sweetest, gentlest man. She 
at this point, I was covering the story. Uh, I wrote a, a piece on uh, Steve Weed's attempt to try to find Patty um, for New Times Magazine. So I was beginning to get deeply involved uh, in the story. Um, meanwhile, um, Jack Scott, who ran the Institute for Sports and Society in Berkeley, posed as her husband in a big escape on Cross Country Drive with his parents posing as the in laws. Um, and uh, they stay in hotels all the way across the country. They are this. They remained in uh, the East Coast. In New York, trying to let it walk as a By this point, the ransom attempts had completely collapsed. Uh, Randy just said, you know, I'm not even talking to you anymore. So there was no ransom at all uh, possible. Well, uh, they were running out of money, so then where else would they go to rob the bank but Sacramento? And they robbed two. The first one went off great. Uh, uh, but the second one was a disaster. One of the customers, Murnasha, who was bringing in Church collection uh, was killed accidentally when it was Harris's gun went off. Uh, this now meant that Patty was being sought in two bank robberies and kidnapping. Um, and, uh, so she had you know, multiple charges. Um, finally, Little Romero uh, was sentenced, and getting them out of San Quentin was one of the objectives of kidnapping Patty in the first place. Of course, that didn't work. Uh, and they uh, ended up getting uh, convicted. Meanwhile, uh, Patty was finally caught on September 18th, the same day that Bill and Emily uh, Harris were caught. Um, she was living with a friend, Wendy Yoshimura, and, and romantically involved with a new SLA member, uh, Steve Salaya. Um, it's important to note that Patty was not living with the SLA members during most of this time, for over, you know, over a year. Uh, they lived together in Pennsylvania with them. We, we connected, but they weren't living together. Um, the trial could not have gone worse. Um, it was a disaster. Um, Tom Matthews uh, spoke. Um, uh, when Harris was given an interview and pointed out that although Patty claimed that she'd been attacked and so on by Willie Wolf, she in her purse had a love token from him, a card, old Matt Brook, a carving that matched what he was wearing. So here she is in, in her purse when she's caught uh, carrying this love token from this guy that she claimed against her. That did not go over well with the jury at all. And she was convicted, uh, as were the Harrisons. Patty got a seven year sentence, served 22 months before she was um, pardoned. The Harrisons got eight years. Uh, I'm sorry, she got commuted um, by Jimmy Carter. Um, there was a very effective community from Patty Hearst. Did really well. And in this AI photo, she was later pardoned in his last official act as president in January of 20, I'm sorry, uh, 2001. Um, Bill Clinton pardoned her along with his brother. Um, where is Patty now? Um, in New York. Uh, she also has a house in Charleston. She's a mom and a grandmother. Uh, and she uh, is very successful in kennel club shows. But she's probably best known as an actress with John Waters, the, the public trash, who recruited her um, and put her in a number of films. She's also a novelist, and she's a philanthropist, uh, particularly involved in women's issues, the Me Too movement, uh, and also um, AIDS. Um, and um, so that's more or less the, the overview of, of our story. Um, in addition to um, writing articles about this, I wrote a book with Steve Weed her fiance, uh, 275 pages actually. He lived in her house during this whole time. Um, you can kill this if you want. Um, and um, basically, he told me the whole story of the three years together, the reverse, and so on. And then as we got close to publication, um, the New York publisher, he decided that the book was a little too frank, you know, things like that, saying, oh, I wish my parents would die in a plane crash or cheating on a Geometry exam where he gave her the final because she wasn't doing well in the class. He stole it from the geometry teacher. Um, you know, there was uh, well, crashing through the safely picket line, just a lot of stuff about his being a drug dealer. In today's world, it's nothing here. I don't even deal. But the weed, the word was get your weed from weed in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so he, he felt 
in, in essence, uh, you know, we had a lot of first memorabilia. We had a picture of the trust fund. We had first rugs in my house because he needed to have a safe place. Um, and it basically, the book was, if she ever did come back, um, you know, after this shootout, he figured this book was not going to help his chances, which makes perfect sense. So he went off and wrote his own book, as did Dan. Uh, and now, of course, I read my book 50 years later. Not his, his story, but, but my story of being in touch with many, many people in this case. Uh, one of them was Bill Harris, who I interviewed greatly for the Oakland Tribune. Uh, his first real interview after he got out of jail. And of course, his side of the story and Patty's side of the story are somewhat different. Um, and that's the problem with covering true crime, is everybody has a great story. I mean, any of you are walking into any prison, everybody's got a good story about why the innocent project should be here now, because obviously they didn't do it. Uh, we know that. And when you have two people in the same room, um, you have a problem because a stress affects memory. And what if they disagree? Now imagine if you have nine people in the same safe house in the city, 1,200 square feet for 53 days, uh, and they all are telling you exactly what happened in none of the stories square. So in my book, we try to give everybody an opportunity to tell their side of the story. Um, and along the way, you know, particularly since this book has come out, um, I met some of the weathermen and the people who recruited by the SLA. But probably my, my favorite story of all is um, San Simeon is near uh, San Luis Obispo. And I did a couple of events there. And my wife and I were staying in a hotel uh, in Morro Bay, and a guy came up and he said, oh, that's where my wife and I stay here. And, uh, my wife started talking to me and said, why are you here? And she explained about this. And he said, oh, I worked for the hearse. Yeah. She said, I shoot their horses. I was at the ranch. Did you know that Patty hit out in one of the cottages at the hearse ranch? So there's all these kinds of stories keep uh, you know, flowing in the guy. One of the things that hurt her terribly, uh, some of you have probably been to Thornton Beach, which is down Daly City Way. Patty was rescued at Thornton Beach one day by a park ranger and fire department. And during, during that time, uh, she had a fake ID and so forth. And that story, uh, you know, she basically could have just said to the ranger in the fire department, hey, um, you know, I'm, um, I'm Patty Hearst. Uh, take me home. Uh, so the fact that she didn't do that uh, was somewhat damaging uh, to her legal case. Anyway, the, the ranger who handled that uh, called me, you know, kind of gave me the story. So there's a lot of local connections um, to this story. Uh, one of the, the most asked questions about Patty isn't whether or not she did it, but what kind of a situation was she in at the time she was killed? What was her state of mind? You know, was she leading a great life and really looking forward to marriage? The answer is yeah. She told Tom Matthews and other people later that she, the, the wedding was really giving her a lot of trouble. She was really worried about she even said to Steve at one point, you know, um, I wish I'd met you 10 years later because you had all these girlfriends and experiences and I, you know, I'm stuck with you. I'm never going to go out and date all these interesting people. Um, so she was having some second thoughts about getting married. Um, clearly, being kidnapped wasn't something uh, in her game plan or anything like that. Um, but it is true that um, when she went into the SLA, there were five very strong famous voices in that group. So when they voted, it was now, Patty was not voting with them. It was six women, three men. And according to Bill Harris, they all had an equal vote. So she realized a lot of what they were talking about from her own experiences was directed at Steve and she did her communication. She did these very articulate feminist statements. She also, uh, because she was from a privileged family, uh, wrote these beautiful, Essays, you know, talking about the one percent, half one percent, you know, the Vietnam War. Um, of course, Watergate was going on at this time. So, you know, Watergate, this story not Watergate, all the time. So she was basically articulating from her perspective a lot of political stuff, including the idea that all these large corporations eventually were just going to get rid of a lot of their employees because guess what? Uh, they bring in robots. This was 1970 talking about automation, kicking people out of the room. So, a little ahead of her time. But the point is, if you go back and read these uh, 
communiques that were published on the front page of the father's paper, um, there was a lot that resonated uh, with people in the movement, even though obviously the SLA was blown away uh, very quickly and uh, their voice was, was silenced. And little Ramiro were convicted, uh, little got out earlier than Ramiro who got out a few years ago, but they're both out now for that, for that murder. Um, I'd like to open this up to questions. If there's anybody here um, that would like to talk about their own firsthand experiences. We've had people, we had one person who had some watches kids in the library, of course. That was pretty cool. Um, we're, we're going to pass around a microphone, so if you have a question or a short comment, right. please uh, raise your hand and I'll come around with a mic. Okay, coming your way. So, what do you need? 
was all ready to win. Uh, and boy, did that not work. Uh, I have a quote here. I'm going to read this to you. There was a meeting of people who worked on the case at the Legal Society. David Bancroft, who was one of the attorneys, the assistant U.S. attorney in the case, said, there's never been one documented instance where coercive persuasion or brainwashing impelled someone to use deadly force against their own kind. So she wrote, she made history when she, you know, in this, in this, in this. Question over here. Oh, I, I really like this presentation. Um, of when I was 50 years ago, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, it's still black. Um, when I was 22. Right. Do the math. Um, it was myself and my roommates at the time right. all went to the trial. Oh, wow. We all called in sick that day. <laughs> wow. We got there at like five o'clock in the morning, wow. and we my friends made up these like little cards, like gave everybody one, two, three, four, wow. like he pretended he was in charge, and everybody we got to go in and sit right behind the uh, the the bed, the. Patty's table, right. and she was brought in. And I really we can't remember the name of the matron woman that walked her in all the time. Her um, name was Inez. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. good. She wrote and, a book, by the way. Oh, she did. Right. She did. Right. I thought I read a book. Yeah, and anyway, it was really fascinating because she had made the full transition from Tanya back to Patty Hearst right. at that time and was like, was dressed to the nines mm -hmm. and was really, really bratty to her mother. Right. who was trying to give her a card for Valentine's Day. Right, right. And Patty just took the card and slammed it down and like rolled her eyes and, and her mom was very disappointed. So that was my one degree of separation to me. Why do you think, why do you think she was so mad at her mom? Just because she's a brat. Her default was, yeah. even, you know what I mean, she wasn't, we used to call it post-teenage adolescence. Right. You know, that kind of thing. So yeah. Anyway, a great time, great story that I've talked about for 50 years, so I really like right. well, one, of the, one of the things that Patty wrote in her book, you know, why she didn't leave the SLA when they armed her, you know, said, go ahead. She was becoming a liability. They knew they weren't going to get the money. They had this huge uh, FBI force after them, and they knew as long as they had her, it was going to just get worse and worse. But she didn't want to go. And she said, one of the things she said was, well, where would I go? Going home it would be pretty tricky at this point. Because you know, yeah. her mom and dad did get divorced. Of course, her mom was completely furious over the fact that they didn't ransom her. She could not understand it. And I, and I want to jump to this um, uh, point. You know, Patty's grandma, if tonight she got a phone call and somebody said, I want $4 million for your, your year when I see your grandma again. I mean, she'd write, she'd write, you know, she'd why, why are, I mean, it would, it would be done before the, she got off the phone, you know. And that's what I'm trying to say. A, a mom in this situation, couldn't understand, and, and there's a line in the book where she, uh, where she moves out, and Kevin is just furious. I mean, they've got Steve Wee, who she hated living there, they've got FBI agents living there, you know, she just, you know, it's on the book, she moves out, moves to Claremont, and, and her cane writes a column talking about how she just, she can't take it anymore. And, uh, and she says, well, as usual, the men are calling all the shots, and I hope one of them doesn't get back. But that was her attitude guys just, you know, taking over other family members. And by the way, this fear of possibly retaliation, you know, if they, if they uh, miss a panic, oh my God, who's next, right? They did bomb Sin City, not the SLA, but the New World Liberation Front. They bombed one of the guest cottages at San Simeon during her trial. But they bombed the wrong one. It wasn't the cottage and the family <laughs> stayed. They, they got to walk. They had the right idea with the wrong cottage. And if you go on, it was a million dollars damage, if you go on the San Simi tour, you can tour the one that they get. Tell me the story. So, you know, it wasn't as remote an idea. Did they idea. It? Pardon? Did they rebuild it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's totally rebuilt. But the guys will they'll give you that, that tour. Go ahead. A question here. Um, what happened to Wendy Yoshimura? Was she charged? Did she spend time? Uh, no, she, she was not. Uh, by the way, uh, she's she's in the last part, she's an artist. She's not talking, but she's living in Berkeley, and uh, she was not sentenced. By the way, uh, the Harrises and Steve Salaya and his sister Kathy, uh, who was one of the fugitives in this case, were posed as Sarah Jane Olson and was arrested in 1990. Uh, she was an actress in Minneapolis, married to a doctor with kids, 
and suddenly she, she was arrested. So five of them were arrested for that terrible bank robbery in Sacramento. Patty was not. She was involved in the planning and the other robbery she actually taken some of the money and guns after the robbery. She was never prosecuted in those cases. And actually she was a material witness in the one where the woman died. And there was a civil threat of a suit by the family of Myrna Akshel um, after this. They threatened to sue everybody. Go ahead. Why, why was Wendy Yoshimura not charged with anything? Um, I think because she had not been involved in any of the criminal actions. She was harboring a fugitive. But that wasn't enough for her to be prosecuted. Uh, but just, just to continue the thought. Uh, so Patty was never charged in either of those bank robberies. And um, there was a, a settlement on this threatened civil action by the woman the family of the woman who died, and it was settled out of court, and Randyhurst did write a check, in that case, a substantial check, along with some of the other um, people who were threatened with the suit, to, to settle it out of court. Question back here. Oh, I have a comment. Sure. Um, people who wave away the situation or just say, oh, well, why didn't she just leave? She at, right. at, certain juncture she was on her own right i think it's important to underline the time period right. and as an example which you mentioned her comrades were burnt alive like no one said hey let's negotiate they just firebombed the place and they didn't yeah, know she was in there in that house. she could have been there they didn't know i mean black panthers were, were being shot right. in the back and you know just at the time like there were no questions asked if you were on the list then you know. Well, one of the reasons they kidnapped her was that Little and Ramiro were being held for the murder of Marcus Foster. They were very worried about him. And so to make sure that they were safe in jail, they put them in the hole in San Quentin. Just while they were being held, which usually, you know, you have to be convicted to go to San Quentin. So that was very unusual. And that was part of why Patty was articulated in this man. There was even talk of a prisoner exchange, of course. Question here. Hi, Roger. Thanks a lot. You and I chatted briefly yeah. before, and I have my own personal connection. I was basically attempted to be recruited, and I'm here to tell the story that I survived. Yeah, I but I'm curious about the fictionalized nature of this book. I don't understand because I haven't read it. Can you explain the intersection of fiction and history? Well, I've read all the books, and people aren't asking questions about some of them. There's one that says, uh, that she was actually uh, having an affair with Donald DeFries under an assumed name when he was in a prison in conjugal housing. I mean, there's all these different theories, you know, with affidavits and all sorts of stuff. There's her book. Uh, there's, you know, many, many different accounts. So in, in the book, the point of it is we don't actually know. Uh, we'll never really know all of it. So I wanted to give everybody a chance to uh, represent their point of view. And the idea is for younger people, uh, this idea uh, that you just take one side of the story or one person's version and accept that as a truth. I thought your point was really well taken that you have to you have to have a more nuanced view. And there is this trend toward one authoritative source of believing the government uh, or believing you know one news channel or one blog or whatever. And I'm encouraging younger people uh, to, to do their own research. And the hope is that the book will persuade people to go out and do their own research and come to their own conclusions. Uh, my pet is because I don't have all the answers, even though I probably spend as much time as any other reporter working on this case. I mean, I've written two books on it, uh, which is, I think, just a small example of how difficult this story is going to be. And I do want to say something about Pat, just very quickly. Um, her life since this happened has been really quite admirable. Uh, she, the book, which is, of course, very controversial, has a lot of good reporting in it. She wrote it with a co author. The movie wasn't very but even if you don't agree with what she's saying, it is interesting to get her point of view. The same thing for Paris. But who do you believe when you disagree? So the novel gives equal time to all vantage points. And obviously, we can't all be there when this is going on. So the dialogue, out of necessity, has to be novel. On the back here, listen. Yeah, right. It's fresh about five. Can you, can you hold on till the microphone gets to you and we'll, so we can all hear what you're going to ask? Welcome back to another. 
questions. I just thought I'd uh, ask you about the question about the flyer about uh, the coroner Nagushi and the autopsies mm -hmm. and six SLA victims. Right. Yeah. Is, is this true? Who were the victims of the SLA six they killed? Well, they killed Donald DeFries, Willie Wolf, and then four of four the women, Nancy Lynn Perry. You know. Oh, you mean the, the, the victims? In the firefight, yeah. Oh, right. Ms. Moe and Patricia Soltysen, yeah. They died, but they burned the bodies alive, and nobody knew Patty Hearst was in there or not. I mean, was, you know, they could have just waited until they, they fled, you know, and tell them. Um, what was her relationship, what was her relationship like with her parents before she was kidnapped? Was she like a misfit or a rebel or the yeah, well, she, she had some problems at Catholic school. She mouthed out to the nun. They asked her to leave. That was one. Um, you know, she made a very Catholic school. That didn't work out. Uh, her mother wanted to be at the end time. Coming out of the she didn't want to be a So there was a lot of friction over Steve Weed and getting married and the idea that there was a teacher. So there, was different, there were different kinds of issues. But I think in the larger context, um, she really just wanted to get out of the family. Remember, um, they were supporting her, um, you know, in, in school and being the rent and everything like that. So financially, she was very secure, but she didn't really quote want to be first, so to speak. That wasn't her. She didn't see herself in that. Like, oddly enough, Stephen Lee, who came from a much, you know, just a middle class family, he was a first in waiting. He was, you know, he brought over rugs and artwork. As I said, her trust fund was showing a lot of stuff from her house. He really, really enjoyed visiting San Simeon. To her, that, was, that really wasn't who she wanted to be. Question back here. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure what you said earlier about, um, about Steve Lee. Did she meet him when she was in high school? Yeah. yeah. And she was his student? Yes. That's and she began going over to his house to tutor, and they began an affair. And a lot of people have raised eyebrows about the game, you know, predator thing and all that. In today's world, obviously, things would turn out a lot differently. But the real question about her relationship with the parents is, why did it take them so long to understand what's happening? People in the school knew that some of the other teachers knew, but why were they in the dark? By the way, he also taught one of her sisters and flunked her man. <laughs> question coming away. Did Daddy like that sister? Yeah. At this time, I lived in uh, New England near the uh, right. where Massachusetts, Vermont, and, uh, right. and uh, New Hampshire come here. We had a very, very remote farm and an intellectual that I had known for years who knew Jack, Jack Scott, Jack Scott, right. came to me and asked me how to hide Teddy Hurst okay. in, in my place farm. In, in New England? Yeah, in New England. It was very. Who was this person? I would not name this person. Okay, but somebody you knew? I knew him well, and he knew Jack Scott. Okay. Well, he had part and why did you say no? That's your limitations, you can name it. No, no, the statute of limitations. Uh, why did you say no? Because she was with the SLA people. Yeah. If it had been her alone, I would have done it in a minute. That, by that point, uh -huh. you know, people thought that with the burning, it would have been very possible that she gave kill. Well, what was he asking? I mean, did they just call and say, hi, by the way? What what state were you in? It was in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. Right, maybe five miles from New Hampshire and six miles. So they were in New York at this point? No, I'm telling you what he was a New York native. He had started over when that started with Jack Scott. He was a teacher at Oakland then and he was saying he said he would need to place him. Yeah. Without your money? No. no. And uh, basically, I told him I would. I, I asked him if she was alone, and they said no, and I said no. Wow. You know, huh. I wasn't going to make any money because they were nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, Randy, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Randy offered Jack Scott three hundred thousand dollars to get her to Cuba. Uh, Jack, you know, he thought it was crazy, ridiculous. He didn't do it. But he ended up suing Patty over her book because he didn't like the way she, she was portrayed. After all the help that she had given him, you know, he had given her, obviously, posing as her husband. Out of that, that's it. 
I, I don't know because I, I, I'm not sure what happened. I assume they settled it. Go ahead. Question away in the back. Did you see the theatrical movie version of the Patty Hearst story? And if so, what did you think of it? In San Francisco, opening night with Bill Harris or Tim. I wrote about it in the Oakland Tribune as part of the interview. And uh, of course, you can imagine his review was thumbs down because, of course, the whole legal defense that Bailey, you know, basically Bailey's defense was these monsters that kidnapped this innocent girl, captivity narrative, and it made a lot of sense, except it didn't convince the jury. Um, so it was a very tough movie. One of the things, believe it or not, they changed the ending of her book. They fictionalized the ending. Uh, a scene with her father that never happened. And uh, Penny was was quite, you know, upset and told Paul Schrader, the director, oh, why, why, why are you doing this? And he said, well, your ending doesn't work. You know, we need an ending that, that's believable. So the, the answer to your fiction question, you know, believability is really one of the problems with this story. Uh, to this day, I mean, the story, you just told me it's pretty unbelievable. I mean, here we are, it's a great story. We have some some other people who were being recruited by the SLA, and they told me some amazing stories. I talked to the one on the weatherman yesterday in Berkeley, and he was there at the time when they were uh, hiding out in LA, and he was just driving around trying to find them to tell them to get rid of Patty because they the weatherman felt the SLA was making them look bad. <laughs> Question right here. So why do you think the jury wasn't convinced? Was there a resentment of her class or her behavior in court? Or um, what factors do you think may have influenced? Well, the, this will really blow your mind. So you know, when a jury is selected, it's an open court. Not in this case. At least it blew, blew my mind. So in this case, they selected the jury in private session, close court, and in the room. Not, were not just Patty's parents, but her family were there. And you know, they were kind of involved only on the jury panel, you know, just kind of <coughs> sizing people up. So obviously the jury they picked did not, uh, did not do what they wanted. So I think they, they, they may have guessed wrong in the jury. I mean, it could, it could get down to just that. The jury selection by Bailey was very, very poor. Cool. You know, he was a true celebrity lawyer, Boston Strangler, he worked on the OJ case, and he, he was flying to Las Vegas in the afternoon. He had court in the morning with Penny, and he flies over there, Jeff, to Las Vegas on another case. So he had a big drinking problem with Penny, and that was another problem. She just hated it. Any other questions? One more in the back. Yes, I've read several books, nonfiction books. Oh. Including uh, uh, Patty Hearst, including Jeff Jubin's book *American right. Heiress, which, which I found fascinating. Um, but my question is about your book. Uh, I, I, I haven't read it yet. I plan to. I, I understand probably historic fiction. But my question is, when you came to write the book, um, how did you pick the dialogue and, and, and the storyline? As I know Jeff Jubin based it on fact, but how did you come about your writing style and, and uh, coming up with this book, I'm, I'm curious. Well, the, the short answer is that I had lived with Steve Wee actually longer than he lived with Patty's family, so I knew him really well. So that character was not difficult uh, to do. I also interviewed Bill Harris, as I explained, and I spent a lot of time with him. So that part was, was pretty easy to do. And then there were the communiques, a lot of factual information, and that was very easy to access. Of course, I read the book you're referring to, and Patty's own book and other books, and a lot of the journalism. But in, in, in writing it, I tried to imagine what was going on in the situations where people weren't there, and come up with a plausible explanation for how things turned out the way they did. Uh, as far as for the, the two or three people here are actually interested in the writing process, I'll, I'll give that about a minute. Um, I asked an editor friend, uh, about several ideas, um, somebody I knew quite well would work for me. And she said, oh, well, the book I read is a Patty Hearst story. That's the one that's really interesting. So I said, okay. Um, and I sent her a, a few uh, early chapters. And she said, yeah, that's okay. I said, okay, well, 
I'll write the last chapter first, and if that's okay, then I'll go ahead and write the book. So that was how the, the story developed. Um, since the book has come out, um, I just did a piece in the Washington Post on Sunday, and I'm continuing to cover the case. It turns out a lot of the things that people are telling me, including one of the people here today, kind of outstrip anything that I could have ever come up with. That's what's, that's what's so interesting about this, this case. I mean, can you imagine one of the most famous Hollywood directors I mean, telling Patty that her book doesn't work, and she's got to fictionalize the ending? You couldn't make that up. Uh, can you talk about uh, her relationship? Please. I'm going to give you a microphone. Oh. Can you talk about her relationship with uh, Waters? And if you oh. know if she uh, saw female trouble? <laughs> well, she thought I think what you're referring to is the, the content of the Waters films. Um, they met at Khan when her film came out, the film based on her book, and he recruited her. Gave her, gave her a test and she passed. She said she wasn't going to be trouble and that's what he wanted an actress. It wouldn't be a problem. I, as you point out, some of these films uh, are difficult to watch in that respect. Um, but uh, more to the point, and this is, this is the hardest act of all, this is the most hardest part of the film career. Her daughter is an actress and she was recently in a mainstream film playing so it's second generation uh, playing these very difficult female roles. And one of the one of the uh, uh, John Waters films there is a kidnapping, so it gets very close to the, the core of the story. But obviously it didn't it didn't inhibit her. Well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Roger Rappaport for his wonderful insights into his novel. Searching for Patty Hearst, and please come and buy a book. Um, also, if you'd like more information uh, from Roger, he's got a book sign. And then have your books signed tonight. And so, please join us for another program. I have two more things. Um, the reason the mail list says we're not going to sell it, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's mainly because I'm writing articles. Um, you're, you're, you're actually going to be in my, my article. Not your name. <laughs> A lot of what I'm learning, um, people who couldn't talk to me all the criminal stuff would kind of come back. Um, two more things. Um, the tour, the author tour, uh, continues at Book Passage on Super Bowl Sunday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Sorry about that. And then at Green Act Pool. Well, the Lions lost on permission. The Lions lost from um, And then Tuesday, Green Act on 9th Avenue. And finally, uh, Books Inc. In Mountain View. And of course, this is recorded, so if people missed it, um, there'll be that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.